So welcome to week two of the story of now, uh, your first at USD seminar in 2021. Um, I am Dr. Dominguez and I'm uh, gonna be the MC again this week. Um, we've got an exciting panel to talk, especially about the problem of problems, misinformation, disinformation, and you know why is it that people are even confused about what is true in this day and age? Um, and so I'm going to actually begin by inviting our speakers to introduce themselves and to tell you a little bit about their academic discipline, their background, and their expertise. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Evan Crawford. I'm in the Political Science and International Relations Department. And uh, generally speaking, um, my specialty is in American politics and a lot of uh, electoral politics and local government. Um, and thinking about political science one thing uh, my, my caveat here is um we have you know several political scientists in our department uh and if you ask any of them this question you're you're going to get a slightly different version of what is political science and what do we do but it's all kind of variations on the same theme um which broadly is kind of looking at who has power um how do they use that power um you know, in a, that, that's kind of a classical kind of definition. Increasingly and recently, I would say we, we, we also always have been, but now it's being paid more attention to is how do people get power in the first place? Uh, what are the rules about that? Um, and, and how do people hold those in power accountable? Um, and so those are kind of the big, broad ideas about uh, what we look at in political science. And, and then I would say somewhat more specifically uh, for, today, for today's and this week's topic, I would say um, another big area that we study is uh, how and why do people think the way they do about politics um, and, and, and what motivates that? And so that'll be a little bit more of a specific thing that I'll, that I'll talk about later. Hey, uh, I'm Dr. Jen Wenzel, and I'm in the Psychological Sciences Department. I'm an assistant professor of behavioral neuroscience, and my research focuses on the neurobiology of motivated behavior. So what are the neurochemical systems and brain regions and systems in the brain that control our behavior uh, to get food or to seek out a mate or to find shelter? So all behaviors that are motivated. Uh, today, I'll be talking about how science is always updating itself. And this is particularly relevant in neuroscience, which is a relatively new field that really is just getting started around the 1990s. So we're always inventing new techniques to discover more about the brain. And so neuroscience is always updating itself. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Kathy Marsh. I'm a registered nurse, and I'm the associate dean in the Hahn School of Nursing. I'm a research scientist, and my focus is on adolescents with type 1 diabetes and how they and their families transition to adult care. Since nursing is a practice discipline, we focus on the application of scientific findings to guide the care of our patients, individuals, families, and the global community. So we look at aspects from the single person to large communities. Today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about healthcare disparities, inequities, and then go back up the chain and talk a little bit about where did that come from? focusing on the social determinants of health. I'm happy to be here today, thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Millie Fulmer, a librarian at the Copley Library in the Department of Collections, Access and Discovery. I've been at USD since 2018 and I'm originally from New Zealand, so you'll have a little bit of a weird accent there. Um, I have a background in art history, so I've always considered myself a visual person, hence my topic today. And I'm a subject librarian for the art department and university galleries. Uh, library and information science is multidisciplinary, so interdisciplinary, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it involves, um, for me especially, it involves development, uh, research support, and instruction for faculty and students, and metadata creation, which uses Library of Congress uh, controlled vocabularies, among other more specialized thesauri and taxonomies. Um, there are issues with these vocabularies, um, a lot of problematic words that are no longer socially acceptable, uh, like illegal aliens. So I've mm -hmm. actually removed those from my catalog, um, but this helps you to search for materials in the catalog. Um, and my specialization is visual literacy, as opposed to the broader information literacy, uh, which librarians traditionally focused on text. 
And some of the issues that I'm interested in uh, to do with visual literacy are cultural appropriation, particularly indigenous cultures um, and gender representation, as well as, of course, misinformation, particularly of a visual nature. So yeah, I'm excited to teach today and meet you on Thursday. So thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, and I am just gonna turn it over to Dr. Crawford to get started. I, I'd kind of like to start with just a continuation of, of what I, I briefly mentioned as, a, as an overall uh, view of the, of the discipline in political science um, and, and kind of tie that into what our theme is for, for this week. So thinking about you know, what we study in political science, as I mentioned uh, a, a major theme is power uh, and who has the power, how do they use that power, right? And you know, at its, you know, maybe the most common thing people might think when they think about political scientists and studying powers, oh, that means you study, you know, in American politics, Congress and the president and, and maybe the Supreme Court, they're the, the big people in charge, which is obviously true, right? Um, and they make all sorts of really important decisions. Um, but, you know, one thing I always like to remind people uh, is we have thousands and thousands of local governments that are making decisions every day uh, that a lot of times are affecting everything you and I do uh, way more and way more directly than necessarily what the, what the federal government is doing, right? So, so you could see somewhere, uh, you know, we can watch C-SPAN and watch Congress take votes on certain issues, which I'm sure you all do, right? Um, it's really riveting. Um, but then also sometimes the really interesting stuff are these uh, local city council school board elections. Um, this one is a recent uh, snapshot from Loudoun County, Virginia. Some parents, uh, a lot of dispute and controversy over, over what we're gonna teach uh, students uh, in schools when it comes to race and uh, even one one parent in particular caught uh, with some middle fingers that probably wouldn't be allowed inside of a school but nevertheless we see the passion right and what are they doing they're expressing their opinions about the job that people are in power are doing and the decisions they're making right and a lot of the conversation and the debate and these meetings is probably rooted at some fundamental level in different understandings of what is true um, and and this you know we can see there's a very real consequence to this um, you know, we think about how do people get in power in the first place? Often our first thought is elections, right? And, and even that's something where we think about, well, how do people actually even vote? What actually happens to any, any of you who maybe, maybe you are about to turn 18 or maybe you, you've already been able to vote in an election, right? What actually physically happens to your ballot once you, once you uh, submit it, right? A lot of that depends on how you did it, what state you live in. Um, how do we know that this dog didn't vote, right? Well, we, we know. But, but, but these are questions we might get sometimes, right? And it, a lot of it has to do with what our, uh, our conceptions of this truth is and how much trust do we have in the people telling us what is true, right? Um, we can think about uh, activism, right? And we think about uh, people trying to hold those in power accountable, right? Whether that's via protests or you know, campaigning for candidates um, and reacting to the decisions that people in, in power are making. And once again, though, uh, at its core, a lot of this is going to, when we see protests and then when we see counter protests, these are physical manifestations of people's different understandings and conceptions of what is true, right? Um, and so uh, this has been going on for a long time. And then when we get even to the most specific and we think about behavior, uh, why are people thinking and acting and behaving the way they do when it comes to politics, right? And we saw this at its most visceral uh, on January 6th, um, when we saw uh, the insurrection at the Capitol, uh, you know, obviously the product of many variables of many factors, um, but, but an underlying theme to all of that was um, these misconceptions of what truth is, right? So when we think about how partisanship is related to all of this, this is a pretty, pretty big question. There's whole books and classes uh, about that kind of question. Um, but I did want to just take a quick note back to last week. I watched the um, last week's class, and in particular, um, some of the themes that Dr. Getz and Dr. Babka talked about. Um, I think you probably have a lot of overlap here with some of the things that we talk about in political science, specifically, what are our expectations of truth? Um, so going into any kind of event or understanding or observation, we are all carrying with us probably already an expectation of what is true. And we can't, and, and so that's gonna affect then the way we, we uh, get this new information that we're about to get, right? And what is the difference between truth and perception? How are they related, right? And so that's gonna be uh, part of that conversation as well. So. You know, how do we know what's true? So fortunately for me, I am not in the math department, which is a really good thing for me and the math department. Um, and uh, so in political science, we don't really deal with proofs, right? The way math does mathematical proofs. And that's the extent of my knowledge of mathematical proofs other than they exist, right? Um, so we don't really use the word prove in political science 
that much at all, but we certainly don't use it the same way you might in, in the natural sciences, right? Um, and so we're not really proving whether something is true or false um, by that specific definition of the word proof. Um, uh, one way to think about it from a very cautionary perspective is we are approaching truth. Sometimes we get, you know, we're approaching truth really, really, really close, like to, to the best we can possibly do um, by accumulating all sorts of evidence that makes something much more likely than not that that's, that that is the truth, right? And in some ways you might think about this is actually more analogous to maybe the judicial system, right? Where somebody's on trial and we have a burden of proof. So, you know, in theory, we have a presumption that defendants are innocent until proven guilty, right? But even in that world of, of the criminal court system and, and the idea of proving someone guilty, what we're dealing with is an accumulation of evidence, right? That do you convince the jury that it's beyond a reasonable doubt, that it's more likely than not that someone did this thing versus did not do this thing, right? Um, and so uh, we can think about it in terms of that one way to think about political science in the broader social sciences as slightly different than the natural sciences when we're talking about delineating fact from fiction or truth from falsehoods, right? Um, so one way to think about this, and this is a little bit from, from one of the readings this week, is if we, if we kind of hold truth up as what actual reality is, um, and then facts are at any given moment in time, what are as humans, our approximations of that truth, right? So there is a real truth, it's sitting out there, um, but at any one moment in time, when we're talking about the facts, it's the best we as humans have been able to come up with to, to understand what that truth is, right? And obviously we know that over time, our, our facts change, right? And, and I think this will get talked about a little bit more, right? It's always, we're always updating uh, what we know to be true. The actual truth has always been there, right? The earth has always revolved around the sun, but it's not, that's not what humans always thought was the case based on humans' best available evidence at that time, right? Um, and so, you know, by this understanding, truth is really hard, um, but facts are also hard. And, and so when we're talking about facts, you know, what's our best human way we can try to understand truth, then we think about, well, who do we trust for information, right? And this is, this is where we're going to start to get into these partisan differences and, and why we, why partisanship makes it so, so hard. Um, because broadly speaking, trust in what have been our traditional sources of facts, like the media or university professors or the government or research scientists has dropped uh, over time, okay? So um, just as one uh, data point, the uh, um, General Social Survey has, is a survey of, of, uh, of Americans, representative survey, it's been going on for decades. And so there's two questions here I just wanted to show you to put some of this in relief. So one is just how much do you agree you know, that science benefits society, right? Just a very broad, basic question. And over between 2006 and 2015, what we see is, even though there's some differences between liberals and conservatives, but you see those, those lines are kind of flat. So basically over time, we have a pretty consistent, yeah, science benefits society, right? It's, it's about half the population strongly believes that science benefits society, okay. We ask it the question a little bit differently, which is how much confidence do you have in the scientific community, right? So slightly different question. And on that front, uh, between 1970 and the 2010s, what you see is some really interesting differences. So self-identified liberals, self-identified moderates, they have these flat lines, right? So liberals and moderates, very consistent in having confidence in the scientific community. But self-identified conservatives, we've seen this precipitous drop that in the 70s, they were actually more confident than anybody else uh, in the scientific community. Um, but that has, had, that has uh, repeatedly and, and kind of significantly uh, trended down uh, over time. And notice this is the last data point here is from 2014. This predates COVID. This predates the 2016 and 2020 elections. Right, so this idea of who do we trust and differences in who we trust is not a new partisan phenomenon. Right, we might be at, at the apex of that right now in 2021, in, as far as how how far apart we are. Um, but but the the beginning of that, the origins of that, is not new. Um, so one kind of example I like to, to walk us through when we think about our, our motivations and the partisan baggage we might bring to, to any, any piece of new information, right? So you can imagine some new study is released and it can be any study that you care about, right? That you think is interesting, that you think matters, climate change, right? Uh, racial profiling, um, how much money we should we spend on education? Some new study is released and we could ask ourselves, okay, does this study 
validate what my preconceived notions were, you know, yes or no. It, are, it confirms what I thought was true or it's, it goes against what I thought was right, right? Yes or no. And then if it's no, it must be a bad study, right? There must be something wrong with this study because it doesn't compute with what I thought the way the world works is, right? But if it does confirm, oh, that's a great study, right? I was right all along, okay? But if, it's that, if, it, if it doesn't compute, then I'm gonna go find some flaws and I just need to find one little flaw and then confirm, oh, then it's a bad study and I'm still right, right? So my, I'm good and I'm a genius and everything is, is fantastic, right? And so a lot of what we're seeing here is, is this idea of motivated reasoning. So I am not a psychologist. I am not a social psychologist, uh, which is where the experts on motivated reasoning are. But from a partisan perspective and from a political perspective, one thing that we know is partisanship is increasingly playing this role in motivated reasoning. That when all, any, any of us, any of our parents or our relatives that we might know or our friends, when we choose what our news source is gonna be, you know, we are making an active choice and whether consciously or subconsciously, we might be choosing that because we think it's going to tell the, the news in a way that is the way we think it's right and the way it makes sense to us, right? We are motivated to, to, to reconfirm what we think to be true because it makes us feel good about ourselves, right? So one, one idea here is that um, when we think about what facts are, so little thought experiment, right? And this comes uh, from your book. And I, I like this one because I think, I think you could probably get agreement. I think you could probably say Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals could all nod their head in agreement that facts are a description of reality that reflect the best available objective evidence as endorsed by the prevailing authorities of society. If you just say, you know, broadly speaking, is that an okay definition of facts, right? And we can imagine Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, all, yeah, okay, that sounds good, right? Of course, the devil is in the details, right? Because then we'd have to ask, well, do we agree on what the best available objective evidence is? Do we agree on who the prevailing authorities of society are? Because if we don't have consensus on either one of those, then this whole consensus on what facts are is gonna fall apart pretty quickly. Right. And so um, one thing that's uh, in the last 10 or 15 years in political science, uh, kind of area of study, is this idea of identities and this idea of aligned identities. And what I mean by that is it's increasingly the case that all of us collectively, race, religion, education, your occupation, is correlated with your partisanship, is correlated with which party you tend to support in elections. Um, and when I say increasingly correlated, increasingly associated, what I mean is that 50 years ago, in the general, in the aggregate, if we, if we gathered a bunch of data on people, knowing their race or their religion or their education would not have been as helpful to predict what party they supported as it is now, okay? So these variables, these things that we could maybe think on paper don't have anything to do with politics, right? Having that information now is very predictive of what party you support. Okay, and it's actually it's even getting it's even extending beyond uh, those variables, right? Even like TV shows and music that you like, sports that you do, hobbies that you do, are starting to increasingly come where it most people who do that thing are this party, and most people who do that thing are that party, right? So, what are some of the consequences of this in political science that's been documented? Is what's called kind of social sorting. So one way to just, as an example, right, that you could think about is, well, maybe 50 years ago, it was the case that if you went to church on Sunday, whatever kind of church you went to, or if you went bowling, when you went to those places, you would be around Democrats, Republicans, independents, people who don't care at all about politics, people who care a lot about politics, while you were doing that non-political thing, while you were attending your religious service or while you were bowling, right? But increasingly now, that is less and less the case. It is more and more the case that if you go bowling or when you attend your church service, that you are around only other people who are of your same party or political persuasion, right? And even if you're not talking about politics at that moment, you're just around those people. And so one of the theories that's being tested and kind of we're seeing evidence for, we're accumulating evidence for, is this idea that only being around other people who really share your kind of political persuasions um, might have this effect where you're just gonna increasingly believe 
your way of thinking about the world is right. Your version of the truth, your version of the facts are correct. Because look at all these other people that you know, everyone agrees. You're not around anyone who doesn't, right? So that's one of these kind of potential consequences of sorting, right? And that these identities, these things that these other non-political things that we say matter to us when I describe who I am, right? What my religion is, where my family's from, what kind of food we eat, right? What kind of hobbies I do. Um, if they're all starting to get wrapped up in, in a partisan identity, then we can see how this can really matter. So I mentioned this idea of the prevailing authorities of society, right? So this was a, a survey that came out, this giant survey um, that, that the uh, religion, uh, I, can't remember, PR, I can't remember the full name, uh, Religion Research Institute. This is from 2020. And uh, this is just the percent of, of Americans who said they have a lot of trust in these varying institutions, right? When it comes to getting information about coronavirus, right? So right away, we can see at the top, the most trusted are university research centers, Dr. Fauci and the CDC. They're the most trusted. And when I say the most trusted though, that's all relative, right? Because if we just take the average of Americans, we're only talking about half. It's only half of Americans that have a lot of trust in university research or Dr. Fauci or the CDC. And what we can also see is that institutionally, right, Democrats and Republicans are widely disagreeing on whether or not they have a lot of trust in those institutions, right? And we can continue down the list and all we're gonna see is less and less trust and more and more of a partisan gap, right? Where you see, uh, you know, and the most, you know, kind of fascinating, but perhaps unsurprising is if you ask, do you have a lot of trust in Joe Biden, right? 58% of Democrats say they do, only 4% of Republicans say they do, right? And that's a basically mirror image of asking, do you have a lot of trust in Donald Trump, right? In fact, the only institution on this list that Republicans have more trust than Democrats is Donald Trump, if you kind of count Donald Trump as an institution for information, right, about coronavirus. And so what do we, I mean, this is, the, this is a big problem, right? Because if we go back to our definition of truth and facts, and we think about, well, the facts, about you know coronavirus and how to keep us safe and to get through this are the best available objective evidence from the prevailing authorities of society. But if we have these huge gaps in what we consider to be the prevailing authorities of society, and those prevailing authorities are telling us different things, now what do we do? Right? We we might be less concerned if well. Republicans only trust Donald Trump and Democrats only trust Joe Biden about this, right? But if they were both saying the same thing, then maybe it all washes out and it's okay. But to the extent that they're not saying the same thing, to the extent that we're getting differing messages about how much should we be concerned, what's the best steps forward from a, a mask mandate standpoint, right? Kind of take your pick. Um, then, then we run into some real issues. So one thing I also wanted to point out is when we think about partisanship, and how it colors our perception of truth. There's a lot of interaction, and this is what a lot of the data shows over the last 20, 30, 40 years, uh, increasingly this interaction between race, religion, and your partisanship, and what issues you say are the most critical, right? So it's one thing if we, have, we, we trust different institutions differently uh, about what the facts are of something, but then we have to add this layer of, well, how much do you even care about something? Is this even a big deal, right? Whatever this issue is. So just as an example, this same exact survey, this giant survey from the Religious um, uh, Research Institute, right? When they just look at white evangelical Protestants, their top three critical issues are abortion, fairness in the presidential election, and terrorism, right? And then when you look at black Protestants, it's coronavirus, racial inequality, and then fairness in the presidential election, right? So abortion doesn't show up there, terrorism doesn't show up there for black Protestants, racial inequality doesn't show up as a critical issue among white evangelical Protestants, right? And then in fact, another kind of just as a, a little side note, right? The only group, the only kind of subgroup here where climate change appeared as a top three issue is among those unaffiliated with religion, right? So again, all of this is to say that we are seeing these identities that people have when it comes to supposedly non-political identities, right? Your race, your religion, but we're seeing vast differences in what their priorities are and what issues they see are as critical when it comes to political issues, right? So, and okay, this is perfect timing. So this is the last thing I kind of wanted to show you. 
as one way that in, in political science, we can get at understanding differences among the general public about, you know, is, is something true or false or important or not. Uh, one way that we try to approximate the truth and get closer and closer using best available evidence. This is a survey experiment. And so broadly speaking, they just took a couple thousand respondents and they just randomly split up these respondents. And they said, half of you are going to get, they didn't tell them this, but this is what they did, right? Half of them got a question worded one way and the other half got the question worded slightly differently. So the question was, it says, or it's more of a statement and how much do you agree? So the statement is, it always makes our country better when blank speak up and protest unfair treatment by the government okay that's the that's the statement and so half of the people got that statement and it just said it always makes our country better when americans speak up and protest unfair treatment by the government and the other half of the people got that same statement but it said it always makes our country better when black americans speak up and protest unfair treatment so those are the two groups right now because it's all random right it's totally randomized so on average these groups are going to are going to be exactly the same same percentage of Democrats and Republicans, same percentage of, uh, of, of men and women, right? The only difference is the question wording. So if that question wording doesn't matter, then we shouldn't see any differences here, okay? So I'm just gonna kind of show you quickly what, what these results were. So first, just looking at all the people who responded, all Americans, there's more support, 61% agreed, right? It's, it makes our country better when Americans speak up and protest unfair treatment. Only 52% agreed with that statement when it said Black Americans, right? So you see a little, a nine point gap there in, in, that, in that I agree it's, it's good and it makes our country better, just among all Americans. And then they're gonna break this up by these varying identities that we've been talking about, right? These things that we carry with us that we think are affecting our perceptions of truth. So first, okay. Um, these are among only white respondents and they break it down by education, right? And by, by white men and white women. And what you see is generally pretty similar to all Americans, right? There's more support uh, for saying it's better when Americans speak up and there's less support when it says uh, our country is better when black Americans speak up, right? And then we can move to uh, the interaction between uh, religion, right? So again, this is only among white respondents and we look at the religiously affiliated and again, what we see is generally consistent results where it's still more support for, for all Americans as opposed to when Black Americans speak up. But that unaffiliated group, I showed you before, the unaffiliated with religion were the only ones that had climate change, for example, as a top three issue. They're also, they're also an outlier here when looking at uh, this kind of question. But now we get to the one that is most salient for political science, which is, well, what if we look at Republicans and what if we look at Democrats and are there differences, right? And so, what we see here is that among Republicans, half of Republicans said it's good when all Americans speak up. Only 24% said it's good when Black Americans speak up. Among Democrats, it was the same, right? It was 71% uh, each. So the premise here is that, and kind of the takeaway is, it's not news to any of you probably, right? That Republicans and Democrats disagree on lots of stuff, whether they're elected officials or the public. and that's that's been that way for a really long time right what is increasingly new is that we are wrapped up in all these other identities that are able to predict what our partisanship is when i know if i know your race and your education if i know where you live if i know the kind of job you have it's gonna be pretty easy for me to pick and, and identify are you a republican or a democrat right that's new and because we're increasingly around other people who are like us whether or not we talk about politics our idea and our understanding of what is true about the way the world works is going to be pretty limited, right? And that will also affect the way we think about our problems, right? So it's not just about should we have higher taxes or lower taxes, like a policy question, right? But it's increasingly about is something even a problem, right? Is something even a, an issue that we have to tackle via, you know, via electing new people who will do these things? And if we don't agree on those, and if the reason we don't agree on what's important is partially because we all are working with different versions of facts then this is uh, you know, at the root of that problem. So I, my time is up, I threw a lot at you, um, but I'm very excited to discuss uh, at the end and then also during discussion sessions and I will pass it off to Dr. Wenzel. Well, I'm gonna continue talking about a very similar topic and maybe give some insight as to why certain groups don't 
trust the scientific community. And hopefully by the end of my talk, I'll persuade you that the tentative nature of science, meaning that science is always updating and changing is actually a good thing and not a reason to distrust science, but rather to trust it even more so. So let me get started. I'm gonna talk about the tentative yet reliable nature of scientific knowledge. So in general, we all want to know the truth. Who wants to know what's true about our world? I do. That's why I became a scientist. I wanna know what's true. As humans, we're curious. What is the truth? We're always looking for the truth. A lot of the time, the truth is durable. It's long lasting. It's reliable. It doesn't change. If I ask you what's two plus two equal, what's it equal? Four, right? It equals four. If I've got two cheeseburgers and my friend gives me two more cheeseburgers, I got four cheeseburgers. Two plus two is pretty much always four. I can't imagine a situation in which it wouldn't be true. Uh, maybe a mathematician is, but just like Dr. Crawford, I'm not a mathematician. So it's a fact. There's a lot of other facts or truths about our natural world that are pretty much always true, right? Fire burns wood, the sky is blue, humans need to breathe oxygen to live, dogs pant to cool themselves down. I can't think of exceptions to these rules, but there probably are. Scientific knowledge, therefore, is really durable. It's really reliable. There's a lot of things that don't change, right? A lot of things we know about our natural world that stay the same. Scientific knowledge is also called empirical knowledge. And empirical knowledge is knowledge that we gain from observation, from seeing it, right? From seeing that fire burns wood, that dogs pant and they cool themselves down. Science is founded on observation. And because of that, scientific findings are well findings are well grounded and durable, like other facts, right? Like two plus two equals four. So for example, we can look at the sky and we can observe. We can see that it's blue. This is empirical knowledge gained from observation. We can use tools and techniques that we have at our disposal in the science lab to determine why it's blue. And through doing this, scientists have determined that the sun's light is made of many different wavelengths and blue light is the shortest wavelength. Therefore, it's scattered by all the molecules, all the atoms in the atmosphere, and it's what's reflected back to be seen by us. And I know that's kind of overboard, but you're going to learn that in your biology classes. Don't worry. The point is, we have tools and techniques to measure things about our natural world and to help us determine what is true. Why is the sky blue? But even though we determine this with the best tools and techniques and scientific methods available to us, scientific knowledge is never fact. We never say that we have proven that this is why the sky is blue, because blue wavelength light is reflected back at us. We say there's a lot of support for this fact, but it isn't proven. Scientific findings are never proven. They're never fact. They're always open for further testing. This can occur through new developments, new techniques, new tools, new gizmos, new gadgets, new thinking, and new cultural attitudes that can help us to update our knowledge. So for example, what if we invented a new scientific tool called a unicornometer that could detect itsy bitsy teeny tiny blue unicorns that are unable to be seen by even our most sensitive electron microscopes that we currently have. And maybe once we invent this tool, we can determine that actually there's teeny tiny blue unicorns that make the sky blue. Then we'd have to update our thinking, right? It's not that blue wavelength light is reflected from atoms, it's reflected off these little blue unicorns. And that's why the sky's blue. Now, to be fair, there's no evidence that this is true. This is pretty out there, right? It's not probable because there's no current evidence. But the point is that science always leaves the door open for gaining greater knowledge, okay? Through an increase in our ability to measure our natural world or an ability to think openly about our natural world. So even though science is durable, it's long lasting, it's also tentative, meaning that it's not certain, it's not proven, it's provisional, it's subject to change. So there are a lot of scientific theories that have changed 
over the years. For instance, we used to think that the earth was the center of the solar system, as Dr. Crawford brought up. We no longer think this. Science used to think that disease was spread from bad smelly air called miasma. We no longer think this. We used to think the earth was flat. We don't think this anymore, despite what some basketball players may say. We used to think that a good way to cure mental illness was through a frontal lobotomy or removing, removing part of the frontal lobe of the brain. This is certainly no longer the treatment course. There are also many more modern examples. These all seem pretty old, right? Just discarded a long time ago. Well, let's talk about some more modern examples. For instance, Pluto, which you may know as a planet or a dwarf planet. Uh, Pluto was discovered and declared the ninth planet in our solar system back in the 1930s. And you can see this little arrow here pointing to Pluto from one of the first images that we were able to take of Pluto, this tiny little dot. However, in 2006, so several decades later, the International Astronomical Union reclassified Pluto as a dwarf planet. And they did this because through advances in our technology and our telescopes, we were able to determine that Pluto doesn't fit all the characteristics of other planets. And the one characteristic it doesn't fit is that it doesn't clear its orbit of other debris. We can see it passes through this belt of gunk out there in the solar system, and it doesn't clear all those asteroids from its orbit. So they downgraded it to a dwarf planet through this update in information. However, in 2015, NASA's New Horizons program flew past Pluto and took close-up photos and measurements. And this is a photo from 2015. So look at this change from 1930 to 2015, the advancement in our scientific technology to observe and study Pluto. And since 2015 gained so much new information, now some scientists disagree with the 2006 reclassification of Pluto. And some scientists say, actually, Pluto probably should be considered a planet again. Well, what's the truth? <laughs> is it a planet or is it not a planet? Is Pluto a planet or not? It's frustrating, isn't it? It's kind of like watching a TV show like The Office. Will they or won't they? Is it a planet? Is it not a planet? Well, the truth is that you can decide for yourself, right? You can survey the evidence that's gained through scientific observation and decide for yourself if you think Pluto should be classified as a planet or a dwarf planet. And isn't this just better than saying something is absolutely true? You take the evidence that we have, the most up-to-date evidence, and decide, knowing that it might change. In the future, we may develop even better rockets and even better cameras and even better telescopes and other stuff. I'm not an astronomer. Uh, that might be able to gather evidence that may sway scientists to decide if Pluto is a planet or a dwarf planet or maybe something else. Advances in science allow for greater insight into our natural world. This is the point that I'm trying to impress upon you. For instance, advances in mathematics allowed us to determine that Earth is not the center of the solar system. Advances in things like microscopes and the germ theory of disease allowed us to determine miasma isn't what causes disease. Um, many, many developments allowed us to determine the Earth is not flat, one of them being space travel, right? We have pictures of the Earth from space. It's round. Many studies also allowed us to disprove that removing part of the brain is going to cure mental illness. It's not, right? We can do animal studies. We can do lesions or removal of distinct parts of the brain and see how it affects behavior and determine, no, this isn't curing mental illness. This is actually detrimental to individuals. So advances in science allow for us to gain greater insight in our natural world and to update scientific theories and scientific knowledge. All right, now you may be thinking, but who cares about Pluto? How is this relevant to me? I learned about Pluto in grade school. This doesn't affect my everyday life, whether Pluto is a planet or not. So what about this? What about COVID-19 coronavirus? We saw an example of this play out just last year. In January, February, and March, the CDC did not recommend the use of face masks for the general public. And this was based on information that we don't usually recommend face masks for other respiratory illnesses. 
they're not necessarily the first line of defense that we recommend. And so they were not recommended in January, February, and March of 2020. Then in April 2020, the CDC changed their guidelines and they said that everyone, even people that felt they did not have COVID-19, should wear a cloth face covering when they're out in public. So what gives? Why do they tell us one thing in January and March and another thing in April? What happened between January and April 2020? Science updated. Scientific studies showed that unlike similar viruses, COVID-19 is commonly uh, passed along or transmitted by people who are asymptomatic, meaning people who don't know that they have the disease. They don't have any symptoms. And so because of this updating in scientific knowledge from these public health studies, the guidance on public health and science changed. Oops. Well, what we found out then is that updating of information makes some people very uncomfortable. And we get memes like this, right? Fauci caused a lot of distrust in people by changing these scientific guidelines. Now, I'm not saying all people, but definitely enough to make many, many of these memes, many of which you probably saw circulating in the last year. But I'm here to tell you that updating knowledge is a good thing. Some reasons why scientific knowledge is commonly updated are that there's time to do more studies, right? Just like in this COVID-19 examples. Example, from the onset of the virus in the United States in around January of 2020 to just April 2020, which is really just a few months, that's super fast, we were able to do the public health studies necessary to determine that, no, this disease is being spread by asymptomatic individuals and face masks should be worn. This is a common updating of science, but it happened really fast, right? That's a lot smaller of a gap than between discovering Pluto in 1930s and updating it to a dwarf planet in the early aughts. New techniques also allow us to measure new aspects of the natural world. The invention of microscopes allow us to have this germ theory of disease and, and get rid of that miasma theory or that bad air theory. There's also new ways of thinking and cultural shifts, right? There's a change in our culture from the 1940s when frontal lobotomies were being regularly used to treat mental illness to now, right? We would never dream of removing someone's frontal lobe to help treat their schizophrenia, right? There are other treatments available for this and we know this is inhumane. There are also visionary scientists like Copernicus that come along and change people's thinking, even though it may be controversial at first, right? To dispel the myth that the earth was the center of the solar system, but instead propose that actually all planets revolve around the sun. So what can you do when confronted with this kind of conflicting knowledge, this updating in scientific knowledge? You can get comfortable with tentative information. Get comfortable with information. You're going to encounter it in your classes. You're going to encounter it in your neuroscience classes if you go into neuroscience. It's always changing. Also, be skeptical. Look at the data yourself and decide what you believe. Make your own decisions based upon the scientific data that's available. Also, educate your peers. If they express frustration with the tentative nature of science, Tell them that's normal for science. And it's what helps us get the most up-to-date information about our knowledge. Many scientific theories will someday fail. And when they do, they'll herald in a new era of scientific inquiry and discovery. You just have to be comfortable that sometimes these theories will fail, but that's a good thing. It leads to new discoveries. And of all the scientific theories that have ever existed, the ones that succeed for the longest are the most durable. They are the best, most accurate, correct description of the physical world that humanity has ever imagined. So they're as close to truth as we're going to get about our natural world. Hi, everybody. Again, I'm Dr. Kathy Marsh, the Associate Dean of the Hahn School of Nursing. And I wanted to begin with saying the title of this talk is a little bit confusing because all of us should know about public health disparities, whether we're educated or not. 
people who are not educated, who are poor and underrepresented, they all know already that the system's unfair. So they don't really need this discussion. But for us, we're gonna focus a little bit on something else. Let me just move my slides. At the end of this presentation, uh, I wanted to speak to you a little bit about, uh, as soon to be um, college educated students, my goal today is to increase your understanding of the social determinants of health and learn how the social determinants of health affect our health and well being, and understand that things are not always as they seem. And most importantly, out of all of this, I just want you to be able to begin to answer the question, why? So as you go through your time here at USD, a professor is giving you information, wanna go back and just say, why? Why is that happening? So we're gonna go on a little bit of a journey today to learn how to create a healthier world. I will attempt to convince you that we cannot do it in our traditional healthcare paradigm. We need to do something new and we need to come together to address underlying conditions related to our health care, which are called the social determinants of health. So I'm not sure if maybe you had learned much about social determinants in your high school biology class. So today I'm going to give you just a very brief overview. It's only been in the past two decades, believe it or not, that the public health community has paid attention to the social determinants of health. The World Health Organization Commission on Social Determinants of Health has defined social determinants as conditions in which people grow, live, work, and age, and fundamental drivers of these conditions. So when I think of social determinants, the, it often evokes factors such as health-related features of a neighborhood, such as walkability, recreation areas, parks, open space, green space, and something you might not always think about, accessibility to healthy foods. There are some neighborhoods who don't have big grocery stores. They only have mom and pop little bodegas. What does that do to the health of the people living in those communities? So all of those factors influence health-related behaviors, whether positive or negative. We have education, your economic stability, social and community context, the neighborhoods, and then the access to care. So the truth is, back to our theme today, is social determinants do in fact impact health. It's not just who you go to as a provider or what health care system you go to, but all of these other topics right here on this slide really impact our health, our health outcomes, and overall our longevity. Evidence has accumulated, however, pointing to social economic factors such as income, wealth, and education as fundamental causes of a wide range of economic and health outcomes. Let's just take one look here at life expectancy. And there's a trash man going down my street. So if it's loud, sorry about that. <laughs> but the benefits of working at home, I suppose. Can you hear me? The United States spends twice the amount of healthcare dollars per capita compared to any other developed country. And we have worse health outcomes. We spend 18% of our GDP on healthcare. Comparing health spending in the United States to other countries is complicated. We all agree with that. Because each country has their own unique political, economic, and social attributes that contribute to spending. However, overall, we ranked the United States, believe it or not, ranks 40th for life expectancy compared to other industrialized countries. We ranked 26th in infant mortality. 
but in 1953, we ranked six. So what happened? Believe it or not, a birthing parent, and we no longer say a birthing mom, a birthing parent has a higher chance of a poor outcome in the United States than in rural mountainous Haiti, believe it or not. That's, that's a pretty uh, distressing fact to think about. So why do social determinants of health matter? For starters, anybody out there, what's the number one predictor of life expectancy? Anybody? If you guess zip code of where you live, you're correct. We now understand that the health of a population is predominantly determined by factors other than your clinical care, meaning do you go to Sharp Healthcare? Do you go to Scripps? Do you go to a clinic uh, south of the border? And so our health outcomes is determined by all of these other factors that healthcare is just a small amount, 10% to 20% of our clinical health care is what determines the health of the community. The other 90% is behavioral and social factors. So if you were born and lived south of the 94 freeway, you are going to live likely less years than somebody born north of the eight. And that, that can be a distressing fact, especially for those of you south of the 94. So, so what do we mean? What do we mean um, by some of this? What do we mean by the social determinants? We mean factors like socioeconomic factors, educational opportunities, occupation, job security, housing, safe neighborhoods, social status, and the feeling that you have a place in society, the feeling that you have a social support system, the feeling that you're valued. For example, Let's take the case of a kid, a young adolescent in foster care right here in San Diego. They have limited or maybe no access to education or maybe some of the um, people, young adolescents experiencing homelessness. Very low chance of getting a good education. So now they're 18, they have not gotten a high school diploma. They're five times as likely to have a poor health compared to all of you sitting right here in this class here at USD. Five times more likely to die earlier than any of us in this class. Another example, let's take a kid who experienced nothing but poverty. And we all know that that's a horrible way to grow up. We've seen it, we've read about it. But in some of our public health classes that our, our nursing students participate in, they're out in the community and they're working with young adolescents right there in the, the communities that are um, serving this group. They have learned that those children are eight times as likely to have poor health than their fortunate counterparts, meaning us with an education and a good occupation. They're eight to 10 to 12% more likely to die earlier than any of us. Social factors are not all inclusive, not trying to say that, but offer some evidence as a strong influence of social determinants and vulnerability. What puts us at risk? A researcher, she and some of the colleagues state that healthcare professions are just now understanding the impact of social position, social class, racism and discrimination, social networks and other more related community factors and how they have an effect on a population. So in the past, many um, healthcare providers, physicians, nurses, et cetera, would say this group of people have higher um, incidence of hypertension than this group of people, just because, and they didn't really see that maybe living in a neighborhood and having continuous stress, wondering about how you're going to provide for your family, if your kids are going to be able to cross the street safely to go to elementary school, where you're going to buy your groceries, all of those are confounding factors now that we say 
impact our health really at the cellular level. And that's something that um, researchers are much more likely to take a look at now than in the past. We, we talk about social networks. And one of the things that reminds me is when I'm interviewing potential grad students for some of our different nursing programs, I always ask the applicant, I say, I start by saying, you know, this is a very rigorous program. You're already working as a nurse, maybe full time. Do you have a person or a group of people, a support system that's gonna help you get through this program? And people sometimes are a little surprised that I'd, I'd ask that, like, I'm tough enough, I could handle it. But we now know that life happens. And as you're moving through your education here at USD, Think about expanding your social support. Think about expanding your social network. So when you do have those three final exams on the same day during finals week, one of your roommates or friends down the hall is gonna say, hey, let's go for a cup of coffee. That's called social support. That helps you achieve better health outcomes. Factors that have the potential to facilitate this are education, income we mentioned, occupation, we talked about social support networks, they all correlate to health outcomes. The social determinants of health have been positively associated with employment and higher paying jobs. So for example, if your parents went to college, you're much more likely to go to college. And maybe some of you sitting here today are considered first gen. And I'm a first gen person myself. I'm the first in my, in my generation, my family to go to college. And let me tell you that first gen pin that I wear on my regalia during commencement is one of the pins that I am most proud of. Because frankly, I don't belong in the role that I'm in. My parents were immigrants from another country. And for me to be able to become an educated person with a PhD, no less, an associate dean of a very prestigious nursing school, all, all the, the variables were really against me to achieve that. So kudos to any of you out there, um, first gen. It's just some things that we wanna to continue to remember to think about. Let's go to some of the health services. We mentioned before the health services really only refer to 10%, up to 10 to 20% of the impact it has on our overall health. Um, as a healthcare provider, you know, of course, I'm very prejudiced about where I receive my health care. I've been a nurse in the ICU for over 25 years before I went into academia. And I could go on and on and talk to you about where you should get your health care, who I think delivers the best health care, who does the best open heart surgeries, who does the best knee replacements. I got a comment about all of that. But thinking about it, that's still only 10 to 20 percent of our health outcomes. Vulnerable populations and those who are not integrated well into the healthcare system because of ethnic, because of cultural, economic, geography, where you live, or other health characteristics. Uh, the, lack of in, uh, the lack of integration, all these different communities are put at risk because of different variables. You may not think really that we have a lack of access, like different populations have a lack of access, but I'm reminded of adolescents that I work with here in San Diego County. As I mentioned earlier, I do my research with adolescents with type 1 diabetes as they move out of child care and move into the adult care system. So um, type one diabetes, the incidence is one in 400. So at many schools, those kids were the only kid growing up that had to check their sugar and take shots all day. And this, re this disease requires a very high level management, mostly provided by endocrinologists and nurse practitioners in the endocrinology field. But now think for a moment about that adolescent that lives way out in the rural community, way out the eight, further, further than most of us travel on a regular basis. That community cannot afford to have an endocrinologist 
because if there's only one in 400, maybe there's one kid out there in that rural community, in that farming community that has type one diabetes. So where do those kids get their health care? They either travel two and a half hours into Rady's, which if you're coming on a every three months basis, which is the standard of care, that may or may not happen. Or they don't go to somebody that's highly specialized that could provide that really specific care. So what happens? They're seen by somebody who may not be real familiar with type one diabetes. Maybe they take care of many, many uh, type two patients, which is common in the adult population. But these adolescents may not be receiving the high standard of care, which prolongs their life over time. So just thinking about geography, where you're lucky enough to be born into or not lucky enough to get access to care. Some things that we don't always think about here as city people, you know, living in San Diego, but it, it's real. Individual behavior is a one part that makes up a social determinant. It used to be in the past, healthcare providers would say, oh, you're overweight, that's your fault. You are addicted to tobacco. You have secondhand smoke. All of these were considered my fault or our fault. Now the, the trend is changing and saying, these are modifiable behavioral risk factors, our diet, our physical activity. I'm sure many of you are tracking your steps on your, on your Apple watch. Um, that's all good. Use of substances, yes, we can modify that. However, we now know that addiction is more of a disease. It's looked at more of a disease. And healthcare providers, we hope, are not blaming the patient all the time. So individual behavior is considered a modifiable behavior risk factor. It is one portion of the social determinants of health. Oops. And then there's biology and genetics. So we can't control for age, gender, genetic predispositions. These are the um, health conditions that your parents and your grandparents had. And we say, sometimes we say great parents, lousy gene pool. But biology and genetics as social determinants are those factors that we cannot change. Age, gender, genetic, it's not under our control. There may be situations where specific factors place an individual or the population at risk for negative health outcomes. So for example, as we age, maybe as somebody who's aging is starting to have some memory issues, and they no longer want to drive and their family says, oh, I want to get mom a new car. And mom is telling us as a healthcare provider, I don't want to drive anymore. I'm afraid to drive. I got law, I was down at the corner in my neighborhood and I didn't know which way to turn recently. And these are things that people tell us that are conditions that it's, we can't control for that. That's a normal part of aging, but it does put our, uh, us, our patients, and our neighbors at risk for negative health outcomes. There's also, for example, a condition that you can't control for is maybe a young mother who's had a, a serious injury and is now in a wheelchair and has difficulty taking care of her two children while her partner works outside the home. Those are conditions age-related, but are unusual and we can't really control for. So yes, they do impact. There are potential negative outcomes related to all of these also. Just something to keep in mind as you're thinking about that. Policy making is also considered a social determinant of health and it does have an impact on our health outcomes. So a couple of the items that I listed here on our slide just for example, installing streetlights in underserved communities. And when Dr. Crawford talked about how his, some of his work was in local politics, I really encourage all of you to think about advocacy. We don't all have to go to Washington, but we all have to participate in our own community. 
And where, what's our community now? Your community is USD, whether it's your dorm, whether it's a bigger than your dorm, whether it's the whole university, whether it's being part of San Diego community, I want you to look around and think, what can I do? Every single thing almost out there relates to health. I know I'm prejudiced, I'm a nurse, but let's talk about reduced traffic speed near a school. So now I don't have to worry about my little kids going to elementary school, getting hit by a car when they cross the street to go to school or increasing taxes on tobacco sales had a really tight um, correlation to decreasing the sale of cigarettes. So those are a couple things to think about how policy making impacts health. Who impacts the policy? We do, all of us. And that's our job to think about that. So two concepts I wanted to just bring to your attention today that really have an impact on policy and practice are the words disparity and inequity. So as we close our discussion on social determinants of health, we just wanted to talk about these two. You've learned some of the reasons why we have health disparity, which implies a difference or a lack of parity. And we talked about that earlier, race, gender, education, the ability to go to school, the ability to have a parent say to you, it's not if you go to college, it's when you go to college. Those discussions that many of you have had growing up and wearing the college sweatshirt when you're eight years old, thinking, you know, your parents doing that subliminal conditioning, telling you, yeah, honey, you are going to college. It's not a choice. Those choices, those discussions really impact your health. Inequity, inequities are, um, disparities create inequities. Some kids get the opportunity to even think about college. Some of us weren't raised like that. Inequity implies a state of being unfair. And I challenge you today to say, what are the differences in the health status or the distribution of health resources between different groups and different populations? They arise from some of the social conditions we live in, where people are born, where you grow up, where you live, work, and where you age. So the takeaway message is health inequities are unfair and they could be reduced by a mix of governmental practice as well as our participation. So what can we do? Like a previous slide said, what can we do? I have a quote here by Barack Obama you could take a look at. We must all come together in a new partnership, government, community groups, academia, business. We have to ensure that everyone has access to education, to job opportunities, to safe neighborhoods. Although I'd love to give a plug for nursing right now because I'm a nurse for over 40 years and have loved every minute of my career. I still have to say, you don't need to go to medical or nursing school to improve health. You just have to care. And health must not be limited to a single domain. We need to talk about health in all policies and understand every social policy in our country should consider the impact of health. My call to action today is urgent. We need to come together to address the social determinants of health to challenge inequities and disparities that are so deeply ingrained in this country. We need to create social policies that will ensure the health for all of our nation. Thank you. Um, today, I'm going to discuss the role of visual information in determining what is true and what is not. Um, in the 21st century, we live in what is commonly referred to as a visual culture. Uh, due in part to evolving digital technology and the proliferation of images or image saturation as it's sometimes referred to. So this week's theme, why are we so confused or why are we confused about what is true, is evident in popular buzzwords that are bandied about like post-truth, 
and an info apocalypse. Um, I'm sure you have other terms that you've heard as well. Um, another now ubiquitous term is misinformation, which I'll define shortly. I know you've already heard it several times, including last week's class. Okay, so how do we achieve visual discernment, often referred to as visual literacy? We now uh, consume information rapidly via visually based social media platforms such as YouTube, Instagram, and of course, TikTok, much to the detriment of our ability to determine what is true. This democratization of knowledge is a direct result of today's participatory culture, given rise to conspiracy groups like QAnon. Hence, um, this need to develop skills in visual discernment in an effort to navigate this new information landscape. So in discussing information discernment more broadly as opposed to visual discernment, um, Jeff Walton says, by elevating people's information discernment, it should be possible to foster a cognitive questioning state where people recognize that all information is provisional and contested by engendering a sense of curiosity in all things People may increase their sense of engaged citizenship and rejuvenate a sense of engagement in the political process. Among other issues, of course, like social justice, um, but it's, it's about kind of not being apathetic to things um, essentially as well. So knowledge is ambiguous and really objective or neutral. Um, given uh, this proliferation of images, the rapid speed in which information is shared and consumed, um, we don't always have the luxury of time to analyze um, and interpret what we see. So in fact, the average human's attention span is only seven seconds. So you guys are doing well out there. Um, however, there are times when we do really need to go further than seeing at face value, as it's often referred to. Um, and that, um, often includes talking about what we now say is slow looking, and there's a lot of slow movements, but slow looking. Um, and you can do slow looking exercises to help kind of um, learn more about how to look at things um, more deeply. Um, I would love to do an exercise for you today, but there isn't time, so. Okay, so let's look at what's going on in this uh, picture on the right here. It's a juxtaposition of the original photograph and then um, the manipulated one. So um, on the bottom, you have Vanessa Nakate from Uganda, who's included in the climate activist picture, but then at the top, she's suddenly gone. And um, when Vanessa saw this image, um, which was the one that went into print, um, she reflected and, and said, you know, she finally understood the definition of the word racism. Of course, the Associated Press that produced this cropped image um, had to come out with some sort of statement. And this was their very weak excuse. Um, the photographer was trying to get a picture out under a fast, under a tight deadline, and cropped it on purely compositional grounds. And um, because he thought the building in the background was distracting. I, it's it's not enough, this, this excuse. Um, so while this is an example, this example does not use sophisticated image manipulation technologies like Photoshop, um, it demonstrates how visual information can be manipulated simply through cropping. But there are ways that we can evaluate visual information. Um, so looking is key to that, but also we need to ask questions that stimulate critical inquiry, such as, what is depicted, um, what is absent, as is the case um, in this cropped image here, who created the visual and for what purpose, so like the intention, and that can be layered because an image goes through a life cycle and its original purpose may change from when it's repurposed later on multiple times. Um, also, uh, is the image credible or authoritative, you know, the source of it? Are there signs of manipulation? Of course, you've got to look at that. And um, what is the social, cultural, or historical context? And of course, this also is layered. Um, images are repurposed in different contexts for different reasons, be it for a meme or whatever. Um, and what is the accompanying information? Because so much information now is multimodal. Um, there's text and audio. So you have to consider all of these elements, you know, as, as a holistic whole, but also disparate parts. 
Um, and finally, it is critical to, critical to reflect on your own biases, whether they be politics, um, religion, and your positionality, which is slightly different. It's your race, your gender, your wealth, um, when interpreting visual information, which I know Dr. Crawford just mentioned um, earlier. So essentially, this is fact checking um, and being prudent with the knowledge we consume. Now, I'm going to go over some terminology. I know um, some of these terms were discussed. Um, particularly there was Dr. Getz and I think Dr. Moran. Uh, so confirmation bias refers to our tendency to be psychologically invested in the familiar and in what we already believe and to be less receptive to information that contradicts what we believe. Um, I think a really simple example would even be just eggs cause cholesterol. Um, dietitians, nutritionists have argued about the healthy nature of eggs um, and it keeps changing all the time. And, you know, you once thought they were good for you and now you realize you shouldn't be eating them um, as often. It's, it's just a, a very simple example. Um, similarly, the phrase fish out of water, they're quite similar phrases, um, is when experiencing cognitive dissonance, a situation in which a person's worldview is disrupted by new information, which contradicts or supplants the current view. And again, another childhood example here, um, you know, the tooth theory, finding out that by, from an older sibling or, you know, even someone at school that the tooth theory isn't real. It's very heartbreaking. And finally, um, we have filter bubble, which was also mentioned last week, um, which refers to a state of intellectual isolation that can result from personalized searches when a website algorithm selectively guesses what information a user would like to see based on information about the user, such as location, past click behavior, and of course, search history. And I know um, some have also mentioned the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma. So again, I would recommend watching that. Um, another documentary is Coded Bias, um, which the library has uh, perpetual streaming access to. So check those out. All right, so just some more on terminology before we really dive into things. Um, so misinformation, there are multiple definitions out there for it, um, but this one is any piece of information that is initially processed as valid, but that is subsequently retracted or corrected. And then there's disinformation, which is you know, a little different. It's the deliberate creation um, and false and or manipulated um, information that is intended to deceive and mislead audiences, either for the purposes causing harm or for political, personal or financial gain. So now I'm going to reflect on this image we have here on the right. So with those definitions in mind, misinformation could be simply sharing something on social media that is false without realizing it. Whereas an example of disinformation um, would be this 2013 tweet, um, which came from the Associated Press reporting that the White House had been attacked and the president was injured. Within just three minutes, um, automated tra trading algorithms responded aggressively to the sentiment signals coming from the social media platform, Twitter, um, and US markets plunged, wiping out over $136 billion of value from the S&P 500 index. Of course, it was revealed later that the Syrian hackers were responsible for the tweet, which had infiltrated the Associated Press Twitter account. And US officials did actually correct the disinformation and markets recovered their losses quickly. However, it is a cautionary tale about the speed and scale of damage um, that can result from disinformation in the digital age. Okay, and just to reinforce the economic um, impact, uh, this is a study from the University of Baltimore and there's so many different industries here that are impacted by misinformation and disinformation, including public health, um, of course, the stock market and political spending, um, among others. So it's, it's an expensive business. Okay, so now we're going to dive into image manipulation, and in this case, authoritative sources. So in the next few minutes, um, mostly providing negative uses of image manipulation, However, it is important to note um, that there are also positive aspects to doing this, such as social commentary, satire, and other forms of entertainment, uh, preservation work, and privacy, so like anonymizing photographs. Um, so this image here you'll see on the left 
you may recognize it's from the 2017 Women's March protest held in Washington, DC. However, the image was then um, altered by the National Archives of the United States for an exhibition. The image was censored, um, essentially, to blur out any uh, negative or inflammatory comments about former President Donald Trump, and anatomical references were also obscured. So why is this particularly devastating? Um, well, librarians like myself, we teach our students about authoritative sources, as opposed to just finding something on Google Images. Um, so what can we do if a government source, um, like the National Archives, is just as guilty of manipulating sources in their content. Um, hence, we need to be asking these and evaluating our information critically, no matter what the source. And of course, you need to use multiple sources to help um, test whether the information is correct or not. Okay, so moving on quickly. Um, image manipulation is a lot of different industries, but the beauty industry is a huge one. Um, this Dior mascara advertisement on the left here is an overly airbrushed and enhanced image of Natalie Portman. The image and beauty on display is so unattainable and um, clearly modified that um, the advertisement was actually banned in uh, the United Kingdom after the product was tested and deemed to be essentially false advertising. Um, however, the psychological ramifications from looking at these idealized images is much more serious. Um, as studies have shown clear evidence that such images can lead to low self-esteem, eating disorders, and body dysmorphia. And interestingly, you know, I see in the last few years this emerging um, body positivity movement. There are influences, you know, where there are more diverse bodies and skin out there, and sort of mocking some of these more idealized, um, you know, images that we see. Okay. So slightly changing tack now. Um, well, image manipulation is generally, um, can generally thought what we know to be true. Um, there are situations where it can lead to unveiling a hidden truth or provide new meaning to an issue. Here's the decolonial image manipulation slide. Um, this is an indigenous artist, uh, Stephen Paul Judd, and his images draw attention to the inauthentic nature and white settler lens of these so-called historic or ethnographic photographs by editing them to include futuristic pop culture um, characters such as aliens. I've also seen Star Wars characters. Um, and Minor, who speaks of this, um, this insertion of fictional characters disrupts the claims to truth um, that we have been trained to see by the genre of the ethnographic photograph, including its base claim of separating the native other from technological progress and the use of media technologies. Now, I couldn't not talk about COVID-19. So unsurprisingly, COVID-19 presented um, another wild opportunity for false visual information. Um, though recently a study actually was kind of interesting. The results um, found that over half the COVID-19 images that were analyzed were not technically manipulated. Um, rather, they were simply mislabeled or used to illustrate misinformation. For example, um, a stock image of a cigarette was used on a social media post claiming that smoking may prevent COVID-19 infection. Um, unfortunately, there may actually be people out there that believe that. Um, and so related to this is this recently coined term, truthiness, um, which relates to the effect pictures on the credibility of statements. Um, even they do, though they do not provide um, further evidence of, for the specific claim these statements are making, um, it generally only occurs when people view a mixture of statements, some paired with pictures or illustrated with images, and others appearing alone, so just text-based only. In other words, a statement picture pair will only seem truer when contrasted with statements appearing alone. So let's say you're just going through your Twitter feed and some of the um, tweets are just text and some have images, you're more likely to maybe to um, to sort of believe the ones that have these images in them. Okay, and uh, I know media was kind of discussed last week, but this is another huge area of image manipulation and misinformation. So 
um, this controversial Time magazine cover stuck in my mind. Um, what we are looking at is two figures superimposed onto the magazine's signature red background. The figures, as you can see, is um, former President Trump looking down on a crying toddler who represents the thousands of children separated from their parents at the US-Mexico border. The text accompanying the image ironically reads, welcome to America. This haunting image of this um, distraught child was later found out to be one of the lucky ones, um, not separated from her mother. While the image is not hiding the fact that it is manipulated, um, the intention of the image is still clearly manipulative. Um, it's important to note that the original caption attached to the photo of the girl was um, sourced from the Getty Images database and the metadata accompanying it said, the asylum seeker had rafted across the Rio Grande from Mexico and were detained by US Border Patrol agents before being sent to a processing center for possible separation. So Time Magazine were kind of using this as their excuse. Um, and now we must talk about deep fakes. So the word deep fake is a combined, um, it's a combination of deep learning and fake. Uh, most often deep fakes refer to videos, images, audio or text uh, created with artificial intelligence, AI technologies um, that enable media representations of non uh, subjects, as well as subjects doing or saying things they've never done or said. And technology is advancing rapidly. A deep fake from 2019 is vastly different from one today. It's less blurry and there's better audio. Also, there are little things like if you look inside a person's mouth, if it's really black in there and you're not seeing those fleshy tones, that's another indicator that it's a deep fake, uh, among others. So um, let's look at some examples here. Um, this is in Myanmar, this video went viral. Um, this image is a still from that video. I don't wanna risk time and uh, internet by trying to play it, but it shows a fitness instructor doing a dance routine while in the background, a coup unfolds in Myanmar. So a lot of people um, suspected it was a deep fake. How could one possibly um, safely perform during uh, military coups uh, driving by there. So people questioned um, how the shadow of the instructor cuts off midway at the two minute mark. And you can sort of see this from the still that the shadow appears to just disappear. Um, but there were also details that made this video potentially real. The instructor is a real person who often performs aerobic workouts in this very same location. Um, then also savvy Twitter users were able to find her location uh, via Google Earth and it revealed that it was on a raised platform at a roundabout, thus her shadow cuts off because of the stairs behind her. Um, and lastly, this is not the first video um, or image of people doing bizarre things while um, coups break out in their countries, especially countries where this happens actually quite often. Okay. And uh, I want to discuss deep fakes um, and also their sort of lesser, less quality uh, cheap fakes. Um, so uh, as you may know, this was uh, created for BuzzFeed, this video on the left, it's President Obama speaking. And it was actually commissioned to highlight the threat to society that deep fakes bring. Um, because it is revealed that Jordan Peele, the director is actually voicing and AI technologies are changing the audio, syncing it to his lip movements. Um, so there's like expletives and sort of things about Trump that you wouldn't say in a public setting. Um, and so this that was a really good video because it did bring attention to this issue. And then um, on the right here, you have this, I have a still from the altered video of uh, Nancy Pelosi, where it was simply um, slowed down the video to make her appear drunk or intoxicated, like not really worth it all. Um, and uh, in a way, cheap fakes are more dangerous because they're so much easier to make. Um, and they do not use any, yeah, AI technology. So the reading for this week um, does talk about this particular incident, um, about maybe the criminalization possible for it. Um, and one of them is the law of defamation. And it's important to note that the reading also talks about how solutions to deepfakes and image manipulation 
um, will not just be legal methods, but rather alternative methods as well, such as social media regulation. Now, deepfakes and political destabilization. Uh, in 2018, the president of Gabon, Alay Bongo, um, had a severe medical condition. He was away from his country for months, uh, seeking treatment in Saudi Arabia. And uh, the people of Gabon started to get suspicious and speculate that maybe he had actually died and that the ruling party was just hiding this so that they could stay in power. Um, so that's why the ailing president had to release this um, proof of life video. This is just a still. Um, when you have the slides, you can click on it. It will take you to this video. Um, but opponents of the president um, claimed that this video that they released was a deep fake. And the Gabonese military actually performed admittedly an unsuccessful a coup because of it. Um, the video was um, had lots of red flags um, that gave friends or experts pause, um, but it was never definitively proven to be um, manipulated content. But please do give it a watch. It's you know the stuff going on with the eyes; they're not blinking very often, and um, some of the body movements are really odd. Um, but unfortunately, no one ever will really know. Um, Okay, so another major issue with uh, deep fake uh, technology is uh, revenge porn, one of the first uses of the technology. Um, here you have Rana Ayu, who was a journalist and is a journalist and an outspoken critic of the Hindu nationalist movement in India. And so she has enemies, right? And her likeness um, was incorporated into a porn video using deep fake technology. The video was widely distributed across India using uh, Facebook and WhatsApp groups um, and leading to death threats and other forms of harassment, including obviously her reputation. Strangely, the uh, local law enforcement did nothing to help her. Um, it wasn't actually until the United Nations intervened uh, that she was able to have her reputation restored and you know, quelled the death threats and other forms of harassment. And this is a really big issue for women. Um, it's mostly women that are getting targeted by revenge porn. And there's been apps that have been like deep nude that you can no longer use because they were deemed to um, be a huge threat um, to women. So I'm almost at time, definitely. Um, so I just want to summarize. Uh, visuals are received differently than text, sound, and other forms of information. They have this ability to be preserved in our memory longer and are a powerful communication tool. I know Dr. Getz uh, spoke about memory last week and visuals that have their unique power in that way. So for a long time, photography was considered documentary evidence and a trustworthy source, but those days are long gone. Um, the old, I'll believe it when I see it, no longer rings true. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you to everybody. Um, so this has been a really great set of presentations. I've got some questions here from the chat, um, but I'll get to those in a minute. And once we get through all of those, I'll, I'll ask you to raise hands if you have additional questions. Um, but I, I actually want to start with kind of a, a, an overall question asking all four of you to reflect on the theme and about, um, you know, you're all talking about ways in which um, information is produced uh, that helps us feel like we should trust the information that we're getting. And there are all these questions about um, sort of who we should trust and whether we should trust scientists. And, uh, you know, do scientists have a, a partisan agenda? And they're, you know, are climate scientists paid off by big environment? Or I'm not sure what some of the claims are. Um, but I, I wonder if you have any insights um, from your work about how institutions like universities, libraries, and scientists, and doctors and nurses, how, how institutional sources of authority and, and people who, who hold positions of uh, authority ought to behave so that they build as much trust as possible uh, in the public, knowing that the public has many different sources of information and it's hard for people to know what's true. So do we have any, do you have any insights about how, uh, how people in authority ought to behave? When I hear a question like that, it makes me think about, you know, scientists that I admire and how they behave like Dr. Fauci, right? Just stating the facts, you know, saying that there is going to be changes when more data comes out. Unfortunately, as we can see that 
put him in a lot of hot water and made him less trustworthy to some people. Um, so I think that's really a difficult thing. If being as honest as possible about the idea that things are going to change and we don't know for sure makes people uncomfortable, you know, how, how do you inspire trust otherwise? I was one of the only um, medical people on our COVID-19 task force during the pandemic from USD. And I mean, in the beginning, we were talking about pivoting to Zoom, to where we were going to put the stickers on the floor it was like a, a two hour discussion where people were going to line up and be six feet apart to now, are we coming back to campus? Oh, yes, we are. But now with the new Delta variant, for example, um, other units, as we call them, school of law, et cetera, reached out to me and said, we have students saying they're concerned about coming back. What are we doing? And I begin every sentence with, we're going to follow the science. We're not going to store the pot and start wringing our hands and, well, we're going to do this, but maybe we're going to do that. We're going to follow the science, which means we may change our mind. What we say today may not be what we say tomorrow, but we're going to follow the science and make decisions based on that. And not everyone wants to hear that all the time. A lot of people want to know. It's July. I want to know what's going to happen September 1. And I say, we're going to follow the science. We can't comment on that. Based on the information we have today, this is how we're moving forward. So I think it's all pretty interesting. And it's also interesting to see which people don't mind following the science and which people like don't want you to change your mind. Very interesting. The, the only thing, I think that's an incredibly uh, difficult question. And I'm, I'm thinking about it from a political perspective where <clears throat> um, scientists, are are not politicians and so when you think about like dr fauci and how no one knew who dr fauci was uh 16 months ago right other than oh, no. sci scientists he right? was uh, around yeah, sorry, during yeah. the aids right. crisis yeah. yeah uh but he was not a polarizing figure um because there was no reason for him to be a polarizing figure um and so i think a lot of times when we think about um scientists are used to just saying what they know to be true at any given moment in time and that's among their scientific community, not a controversial thing. Um, but this intersection then, when, when politicians and our elected officials are going to base policy that governs our behavior based on what those scientists are saying, and if some segments of the population hate those politicians or already don't like those politicians or already don't trust those politicians who are making those decisions, it's almost like the transit of property, right? Like, well, I don't like uh, those Republicans or those Democrats that are in a position who are making these decisions for, for my community. I don't trust them. And they're saying they're basing everything based on Dr. Fauci. Ipso facto, I don't trust Dr. Fauci. I don't trust this. And now anything Dr. Fauci says is, is, is viewed skeptically, right? Um, I don't have a solution to that at all. I think if I did, I, I, I don't know where I'd be. But, but I think one thing for all of us, for like one reason we're here is um, you, I, I always find it helpful to think about if, if someone's lying, if someone's just completely making something up and they're in this position of authority and power, um, I always ask like, why, why, what's their motivation to lie? And wouldn't it be really easy to catch them in that lie, right? Because we, so that's one thing I always kind of think about is, um, you know, we might be conditioned socially to think politicians bend the truth uh, to say the least for their own partisan benefits. And we know what their motivations are and we can kind of uh, take everything they say in through that light. Um, in, 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 in science and in academia, uh, and I think Dr. Dr. Wenzel said it best at the beginning of, of her talk, which is, we like to know the truth. We all want to know what the truth is. And to the extent that you, we, that requires us updating or, hey, we thought it was this before, but we were actually wrong. It's actually more like this, is the thing that we're always pursuing. And so if someone is out there peddling lies and, and people think that, they're all lying to us. There would be other academics out there saying, whoa, whoa, whoa actually, no, because we're, we're trying to pursue truth, right? So well, there's a reason that uh, a lot of, in academia, we, we are very cautious when we sit, make claims because we're so afraid of being wrong. And we will for sure in our own minds be shown to be wrong because there are other academics who are gonna look at our data and are motivated to be like pursuing the truth. And if we made errors, they're gonna find them. Um, and it's because it's all in pursuit of that truth. Um, so I think for everyone, it's just kind of one of those things to, uh, 
you, you have to keep kind of having those conversations and, 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 and think about if someone's making wild claims that other people are lying to us, um, you know, do your own due diligence. Um, I, don't know, I, I have more to say on that related to, I think, one of the questions in the chat. I'll come back to that later. Oh, and I'll just briefly add, um, yeah, due diligence is really important in terms of evaluating your sources. Also seeking out um, as many sources as possible to compare and contrast information that may contradict each other. Um, but yeah, I really don't want you to come away from this being so cynical that you won't believe anything you hear or read anymore. But it, it's a hard question and, and solutions. Um, to, to figuring that one out. So yeah, it's definitely a hard question. Um, and one that uh, I think people who are in the business of producing knowledge um, and, and uh, communicating about truth to the public, this is something that we're confronting. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the public nature of um, building trust and authority um, and not necessarily being given, the, the authority figures are not necessarily given um, automatic deference over authority uh, with uh, the advent of the internet and its kind of communication. Um, and so I, I, it's a, there's, there's challenges there for people who are in the business of producing information. Um, I will go to some of the questions that came up in the chat now. Uh, so I've got a question for, Ms., uh, for Dr. Crawford. Um, we had a student who asked, where can we find the citations for the surveys that you mentioned? And you know, just to add to that, sort of why should we believe those, those surveys that you put up on the screen? Later. I, I have the links for all of the, so, so the, the one is the general social survey, uh, the other is the uh, public um, religion research institute survey. So all of that, um, their data is available uh, on, and they've been doing surveys for, for decades. Okay, so uh, I'll say a couple things. One, um, there you go, there, there's the links, you're welcome to go, to go uh, take a look at what they produced. Um, the, 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 PRRI, the religious one, which is what most of the surveys I was showing you, that's from their most recent survey. So what they have available to you, to all of us right now, is their report, uh, which is way more extensive than the little thing I just showed you, the tip of the iceberg. Um, and then they're also their survey methodology. So you should read that. Um, their actual raw data for all that survey will probably be made available in about a year. To usually these big survey organizations, they're going to, you know, they're going to do their survey, they're going to put out the reports, but they're going to hold on to the data because they worked really hard and spend a lot of resources putting it together. So they're going to hold on to that usually six months, a year, and then they make all of the public, uh, all that data available to the public. Why do they do that? Because it's transparency, because then other researchers get to look at that data. They might have other questions they want to ask. They might want to validate that what they read in this report is actually a, a valid interpretation of what these researchers say it was, right? So the, the question about why should we believe them is a really good question. And I guess my simple answer to that is, no one's making you believe them, um, you know, and I think it's actually a really good case study here, right? So if any of the findings that I showed you from some of those surveys, for some of those findings, some of you might have kind of just been nodding your head like, that makes total sense to me. I totally believe that. And you probably don't feel motivated to go dig into the raw data to confirm that it's right, because it, it validated what you knew to be true. And hey, here's data from this uh, re research institute, and here's a professor presenting it as part and, and you know that lends some authority there so um that sounds good but for some of you maybe there were some parts where it's like that seems not the way i thought the world works right i don't know if i believe this and maybe then because of that uh you looked at me and said when well, i don't even know this guy and so i guess he's a, a university professor but you know what that's not a prevailing authority uh, of society that i'm ready to accept at this moment partially because i don't know if i buy this data okay great Go, go look at the data yourself, right? It's there for you. Um, you can look at the methodology, right? And you can do the work to see. And the other thing I would say is, and, and um, um, this was also mentioned, was a lot of these questions when it comes to politics and public opinion surveys and how Republicans and Democrats are different from each other, there's lots of polling organizations. They ask a lot of the similar questions. So you can triangulate, you can go find other, uh, and, and if, again, it's about accumulating evidence. If more and more surveys from different research firms, some academic, some private, are kind of all pointing in the same direction of showing similar public opinion results, we can probably be more and more confident that this is a, a reflection of society that is you know, pretty accurate. Um, we also had some questions for Dr. Marsh. Um, uh, there were several different ones, so I'll ask, uh, I'll ask a couple of them and you can, you can answer them each one at a time. Um, the first question is, um, someone had once read that income level is the highest predictor of life expectancy. Is that true? 
I think there's a few things that go together as we talked about with social determinants, not only income level, but education, which impacts impact le uh, income level. Um, parental education level also impacts your income based on if you're going to have an inheritance, things like that. So you kind of have to look at all the social determinants together. And a second question, as location is the greatest determinant of physical health, uh, is there a similar direct correlation between zip code and mental health? There have been some studies about that that I probably can't comment on just off the top of my head, but there are a lot of studies coming out now about access. It's mostly related to access to care with relationship to zip code. Um, thinking about some of the laws that states are passing affecting um, trans and LGBTQ plus people, um, do you think that the laws that have been recently debated as to whether or not healthcare providers can turn away queer patients, do you think that that will affect the life expectancy of those patients? Well, depending on another thing is depending on where you live, there's different access to care. For example, if you're on the East Coast in Boston, there's a great clinic called Fenway Clinic, which is an LGBTQ clinic. Um, the West Coast has nothing like that, really, especially here in San Diego. And there's some of us at different levels talking about how we can get an LGBTQ um, clinic or system set up. Again, that's really educating ourselves and our peers at the, the provider level. So things are in the talking phase. Is it going to impact their, their longevity? Was that, I think that was the question. Um, possibly could. If you continue to feel marginalized, um, that's not a great way to live and that'll impact your health outcomes. So getting a provider that's sensitive is um, the most important thing. And then someone also asked about uh, whether free public health care would make a difference in the kinds of social determinants of health questions that you were talking about, or is the problem really, is, is our health disparities rooted so, so much more broadly that public health care wouldn't necessarily fix that? Well, I would suggest, let's just take a look at one thing, maybe early child care. If women were able to get back into the workforce because they were able to send their babies to a, a child care system where they would get affordable child care or subsidized child care, then women are not, for one thing, women won't be out of the workforce. Women will be able to contribute to their family income and children will be able to be taken care of. So that's one way to look at um, at that question. There's so many different ways. Access to care, yeah. Um, the Affordable Care Act, which was on the chopping block, you know, that was only 2010 when that came about. And with our previous administration, that was slashed. And now we're working on building that up. So there's a lot going on with healthcare right now that's really important for us to be aware of. Um, and then we had uh, a question for, for uh... About, about filter bubbles, thinking about the, the image manipulation question. Um, if you could talk a little bit, someone, someone wanted you to talk a little bit more about what filter bubbles were. I know those came up last week. Mm. Um, yeah, I think and Dr. Moran also talked about it. Yeah, I mean, it's a big part of that is algorithms, um, trying to customize um, your experience on the web um, to things that they already know that you are interested in like. But I also just algorithms, of course, um, I follow in terms of my news sources, um, news sources that I kind of agree with either because I find them more authoritative and um, genuine. Um, so let's say I'm someone who doesn't really think Fox News is very good, but I follow NPR and um, Al Jazeera News or something like that. So we're, we're also doing it ourselves as a kind of a combination of um, Yes, algorithms, but also our own selection of what media we choose to read and follow. I hope that helps. Um, also, my slide does have the definition again, if you need it. Uh, this has been a great panel, and we'd like to thank our panelists uh, for spending some time with us today.